as we have things of earth that tend to thrill our souls, but the one who should be thrilling our souls, not just making them slightly happy, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, again looking at verses 1 through 8. Three week, two weeks ago, we looked at the introduction to prophecy, where we covered all the different types of prophecy, handed out three different handouts that week uh, with all kinds of condensed information about the different systems of prophetic theology. And I trust that hopefully some of you have read over that, looked at the charts, we handed out a couple of charts at that point, and different things that uh, you should have been reading. Uh, we had um, given an assignment for some reading. I'll be asking about that just a little bit later on this evening uh, to see who has read all of those chapters. So if you haven't read those chapters out of all those Old Testament prophetic books, as I'm talking along here at this introductory part, grab your Bibles, get them out quickly, read them very fast. <laughs> okay, and then last week we looked at an overview of the book of Revelation. We gave you a division, which we'll go over very briefly tonight, a division of the book of Revelation, which is very balanced, very structured as we go through the book. We discover that God has given us a balance, not only within the book itself, but between the first and last books of the Bible, and there is structure in between. We won't be able to go over all of that, but perhaps I will, as we go through, give you some structures from some of the other books, especially the prophetic books, so that you'll see the way in which they relate to and parallel the book of Revelation. And tonight, we want to actually begin looking at the text, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, verses 1 through 8, introducing the judge, the one about whom this book is written, the one who gave the revelation, the one to whom we must listen, for he is not merely King of kings and Lord of lords, but he is also the head of the church, the body of Christ. He's the heavenly bridegroom, and he's presented that way in the book of Revelation. He's the one to whom we must be in submission and obedience. Beginning with Revelation 1.1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the angels of earth shall hail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we pray for your blessing upon your word tonight, that as it goes forth it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, a quick review of the things that we've covered so far. First, we laid down some ground rules. So far, we've had an introduction to prophecy to see how both the Old and the New Testament give a substantial amount of space to the end times. One-third of the Old Testament is prophetic. 
The Old Testament contains very large amounts of prophecy, not only concerning the first coming of Christ, but it also contains large amounts of prophecy concerning the second coming of Christ, with the exception of the church and the rapture. The second thing we need to realize, the Old Testament not only restates and clarifies many Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ, but New Testament prophecy gives new information not revealed in the Old Testament, things that are called mysteries. And I've mentioned to you before, in fact, several years ago, we went over the 17 different mysteries that are listed for us in the New Testament. And the definition of that is given to us in Ephesians 3. Since we've studied that before, we'll not go over it again. Thirdly, we talked about how we need to understand that all of the symbols which are used in the book of Revelation, like it talks about seals, it talks about bulls or vials, it talks about dragons, it talks about horsemen, all of those symbols are found elsewhere in the scripture. And as we look, we discover what those things mean. We don't have to guess. The symbols that are used in the book of Revelation, the white robes, for example, are explained. Every one of those symbols is explained somewhere else in the scripture. And so as we piece together those various Old Testament prophecies that I hope you have read, we'll begin to see that a lot of that gives to us an undergirding and a backdrop for what happens in the book of Revelation. Fourth, one of the basic hermeneutical principles of the Bible that we talked about is to take the actual events literally even though symbolic language is used. The fifth thing we've talked about is you cannot understand New Testament prophecy without first having a good grasp on Old Testament prophecy which describes the same subject. That was true about the first coming, obviously, and it's also true about the second coming. The sixth principle that we studied, it's important to understand that Israel and the church are not referring to the same group of people. God still has a distinct plan for national Israel as well as a distinct plan for the body of Christ, the church, which is an international group, not a national entity that is physically related to Abraham. We are spiritually related to Abraham, but God still has a plan for the natural descendants of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. Then seventh, we gave you a few select Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ, some of which, the ones out of the Old Testament, speak of the second coming, the ones out of the New Testament speak of the rapture. They are two distinct things. Now, on that list that I gave you several weeks ago, by the way, if you weren't here, if you didn't get those lists, I gave three sets of handouts that had all kinds of very interesting information and summaries on it. If you did not get those, please be sure to see me after the service tonight because I'll get you copies of all those different handouts. They're important for you to know and to understand as we go through this book. But for those of you who knew about the passages, who perhaps heard about them and wrote them down because you were out of town but listening somewhere else, I said I would ask again tonight. You had a whole week, those of you who weren't ready last week. How many have read all those prophetic passages that I gave in the list? May I see your hands? Ah, we have a few. Good, good, good. So, I hope all the rest of you will. Daniel 7 and 8, that relates to the four world empires that, and the one that's finally going to be ruled by the Antichrist. Uh, Psalm 2, it specifically quoted in the New Testament about the second coming. Psalm 110, which I wrote my, what's called the baby thesis at Dallas Seminary on relates to the second coming of the defeat of the Antichrist. We talked about Ezekiel 38 and 39, Zechariah chapter 14, Joel 2, the day of the Lord, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25, Jeremiah 30, 10 through 24, where we see the judgment uh, based on how the Gentiles treat the Jews, and Jesus refers to that in Matthew as well. And Isaiah 50, uh, 65 and 66, which is the millennial reign of Messiah. We talked about the four different basic positions Premillennialism, Christ coming back before the millennium. Amillennialism, where there is no millennium, that's where most reformed people stand today. Postmillennialism, where a few people who are very, very stubborn and who refuse to admit that the world is not getting better and better, 
uh, post-millennialists said the world's getting better and better, and when it really gets good, that's when Jesus will come back. It doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon if you're paying attention to the news. That's sort of a dead theory. And then preterism, where it is claimed, and many people today are moving into that out of reform circles, uh, where they no longer uh, hold to amillennialism because they see the evidence is too strong for other things, and so they conclude that all prophecies concerning the second coming were fulfilled in 70 AD when Rome sacked Jerusalem. And then I gave you out a, a chart that related to that. Then last week, we went over a structural book, a structure of the book of, out, of uh, the book of Revelation, the introduction, chapter 1, B, the people on sin-cursed earth, chapters 2 and 3, and then C, which is chapters 4 through 20, the key events of things to come. We saw that there were seven sets, and each set gives you a picture of what's going on in heaven, then it's followed by a picture on earth. Then we move to the second set, there's a picture of what's going on in heaven, then a picture of things going on on earth, and all the way through all of the seven different sets until we get to the end, where we see people not on the sin-cursed earth, which we saw at the beginning, but we see people on the new uh, earth in chapter 21, 1 through 22, 5, and then we have our conclusion in chapter 22, verses 6 through 21. So tonight, we want to look at the book of Revelation introducing the judge. And I hope as you heard me read that in a little bit earlier, that there were some important things that stuck out to you. First of all, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, some of your Bibles may, and I've seen some of the older editions especially, where it says at the top of the book, the revelation of St. John the Divine. How many of you have a Bible that says the revelation of St. John the Divine? Okay. What does the first sentence in this text here say? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say the revelation of St. John the Divine. It's not St. John the Divine who is giving the revelation. It's not St. John the Divine about whom the revelation is. It's not St. John the Divine anything anywhere in there until it gets to, you know, it was given to him by Jesus. And it was for a specific purpose. But the revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how it should be headed because that's what it says in the text. Christ is both the subject and the object of this revelation. Now we tend to think of revelation as a name for a book. Some of you may remember where I went over some of the very basic doctrines related to Scripture. One of those doctrines is the doctrine of revelation, then the doctrine of inspiration, then the doctrine of illumination, then the doctrine of preservation. Those are four essential key doctrines that relate to Scripture. And so this is a specific revelation. It is new material given by God from heaven to man so that we'll have a distinct unit, a compact unit, of all the things related to the second coming of Christ, which are scattered all over the Old Testament, plus new information not given before that relate to the rapture of the church where we're caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds and evermore be with the Lord. And so what we have here is a system of theology that gives to us the capstone of all of biblical prophecy when we get to the revelation. And it is a revelation that centers around Jesus Christ. He is the heart of all revelation. He is the heart of all prophetic revelation. He is the one who begins it, He's the one who ends it, and that is what we find claimed here in this opening chapter of the book of Revelation. So he's not only the one who reveals himself in these chapters, but he's also the one that is unveiled in all of his majesty and glory in the book of Revelation. It's sort of like you might say an autobiography. It was written about Jesus, and it was written by Jesus. This is revelation that he's giving to John to tell others. The second thing that we see as we look at these opening verses is that the Son always acts in harmony with the Father. That's why we read in verse 1, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. God the Father gave this revelation to Jesus to show unto his servants 
the things which must shortly come to pass. Now, we always see the Lord Jesus Christ functioning hand in hand with the Father, never outside of the will of the Father, always doing what the Father commanded him to do. He always works in harmony with the Father. And we find that many places in the Gospels. Let me give you just a few of those, especially in the book of John is where we see that. But for example, in John chapter 5, verse 19, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, now listen carefully, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So that's why we see this opening phrase in the book of Revelation about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. We find another illustration of this same principle over in John chapter 5, verse 30. Jesus is speaking, and he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus always, always functions in harmony with the will of the Father. He doesn't step outside it. That's one of my goals in life, is to be in harmony with the will of God, not to step outside of it. I hope that's one of your desires, too. As we are conformed to the image of Christ day by day, that means we are being conformed to the will of God. So that we step outside the will of God fewer and fewer times as we grow in faith and as we grow in maturity and as we grow closer to Christ. Another verse over in John chapter 8, verse 28, again showing that the Son always acts in harmony with the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and, listen carefully, that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And that's exactly what we see here in these opening verses in the book of Revelation. The revelation which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. So he got it from the Father, and now he has a specific task, what to do, to show to his servants, that's us, the things which must shortly come to pass. The third thing that we learn as we look at these opening verses in Revelation chapter 1 is the purpose of the book is fivefold. There are five purposes for the book of Revelation. Number one, to teach Christians. To show unto his servants. To teach Christians. You say, well, why in the world does God want us to tell us about these things? They're scary things. Well, we don't want to hear those things. Those are bad news things for the earth, especially as we get farther down and we see all the different judgments that are going to fall on the earth and all the people that are getting killed. Huge amounts of population being wiped off the face of the earth. All kinds of horrible plagues taking place, all kinds of wars taking place. Even the animals are killing people. I mean, boy, you get into the book of Revelation, you've got a lot of bloodshed. By the time you get to the end of the plagues, more than 50% of the world population is annihilated. Eight billion people on earth right now? Think about four billion of those people dead. Through horrible deaths. And all the horrible things that happen to the rest. They're covered with boils and they're bitten by all kinds of horrible creatures. And I mean, whoa, it's, it's, it's a really tough looking book. So why does God want to teach this to Christians? Well, that is for the second reason that the book of Revelation is given. And we'll be looking at these uh, places as we come to them in the book of Revelation, but I'm giving them in summary to you right now. Number one, which is stated in our text tonight, is to teach Christians, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. But the second is to warn Christians. We'll see that precisely when we get into the letters to the seven churches. Those are warnings to the churches in light of the events that are going to be coming upon earth, here's the way that you should be living. Number one, to teach Christians. Number two, to warn Christians. The third reason given to us in the book of Revelation is to encourage Christians. To encourage Christians. Because as we discover, by the time we get to the end of chapter 3, the church is out of here before the judgments on earth begin. 
So we have a short period of time in which to heed the warning, take the advice given in the book. Remember what it said? It said, blessed is he that hears and reads the things that are in this book. What's the blessing in that? Well, we're going to see that because it is to encourage us, and number four, to prepare us for the imminent return of Christ. Number one, to teach us. Number two, to warn us. Number three, to encourage us. And number four, which is very closely tied to that, to prepare Christians for the imminent return of Christ. And then number five, which should be the result of all biblical prophecy. John tells us the same thing over in 1 John. He says, every man that hath this hope in him, that is the blessed hope, the hope of the imminent return of Christ, Every man that hath this hope in him does what? Purifieth himself even as he is pure. Not purifies himself according to his own standards. Purifies himself according to the ultimate standard. Purifies himself even as he is pure. How pure is Jesus? How pure is Jesus? ultimate purity, total purity, absolute spotlessness, absolute blamelessness, even as he is pure. So number five is to motivate Christians to more faithful service in purity. To motivate Christians to more faithful service in purity. Because it's written to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The fourth thing that we learn from our text tonight is the revelation is certified to a specific apostle. That is the apostle John, the beloved disciple. Something else that's very interesting in the text, we're told specifically, it was also delivered by an angelic messenger, and I think there's a reason for that, to guarantee that there were no slip-ups along the way. Satan opposes the revelation of God. He has fought the Bible throughout his entire career. He has fought the Word of God since the very beginning in the book of Genesis where he came to Eve in the garden and he said, Hath God said? He always challenges, always questions what the Word of God says. He always wants to tempt you to change it just a little bit. And so here we find that there is an angelic oversight of this book. An angelic messenger gives it to John from Jesus, who has received it from the Father. So it has apostolic authority, angelic oversight, since a great deal of the book, by the way, we talked a little bit about this this morning. We'll be getting into a lot more of it in the book of Revelation. But it has a great many insights into what angelic beings do, and we discover that in the book of Revelation. The fifth major thing that we learn from these eight verses, imminency is one of the biggest keys to the book. You notice there twice, things which must shortly come to pass. Imminency. We don't know when, but we need to be ready all the time. Now, some of you, I'm sure, are aware of the Coast Guard motto, Semper Paratus, which means always prepared. That should be the motto of Christians, always prepared. It may be at morn, it may be at noon, it may be at evening. We don't know when. But suppose you're living a life for Christ, living a life for Christ, living a life for Christ, and you decide, man, he hasn't come back yet. That sure looks like a really great temptation. You know, he doesn't seem to be coming back right now. Everything's going along smooth. I guess I'll go do it. And how would you feel as you stepped into that temptation and you are enjoying it to the hilt? And you can think of whatever temptation you want to put into your head. You're enjoying it to the hilt and suddenly the trumpet sounds and you're caught up to meet Christ in the cloud. In a twinkling of an eye, you don't have time to repent. You don't have time to change course. You don't have time to get out of that situation. You're gone! And standing in front of Jesus, as he shakes his head, lets you walk by, and then to the next person says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You'll make it because you're saved. But there's going to be mud pie on some people's faces when the trumpet sounds and the rapture occurs and they're called up to meet the Lord in the clouds. The book of Revelation is designed to put us on notice. Imminency is one of the biggest keys to this book, the things which must shortly come to pass. So our model should be like the model of the Coast Guard, always prepared. The sixth major thing that we see in the book of Revelation is once again we see in these opening verses that God chooses to use people to communicate his word. You know, that's rather standard as you get through scripture. An angel here carries it to John. But who's responsible for proclaiming it to the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's John who's responsible. I've always wondered, always been amazed at the thought that God uses people. I mean, I really wonder why he uses you, but mostly I wonder why he uses me. Doesn't that seem strange to you? Think about how sinful we are. Think about how weak we are. Think about how scared we are. Think about how hesitant we are to share the gospel with somebody else. Question for you. Do you carry these little pocket calendars that we had printed up? We're already in August. That's the eighth month of the year. I think I still have about a thousand of them, although we stick them around the auditorium. I do this quite frequently, stick them around the auditorium. I give out those things like crazy. I'm constantly running out in my wallet because every place I go, I try to give one of those calendars. It has the gospel on the back to the people who have waited on me or pumped my gas or served a table or taken a toll at a toll booth. I go to the store to buy something down at Home Depot. I'm always handing out those little cards. I have only had one person, a lady at a toll booth, only one person reject that little calendar. Are you prepared and are you showing that you're using the time wisely by the way in which you witness? The book of Revelation should motivate you to do that. If you study that book, if you see what's going to happen to the people who are left behind, if you see the suffering that they're going to go through, if you understand the reality of hell, it will make you want to run and give them tracts and talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I've told you before about a young man, a young military man that I led to Christ back in 1968. And he was so excited. I was the captain at the Sermons from Science Pavilion, the Moody Science Films, at Hemisphere in San Antonio, Texas. I was in charge of about 140 young people. I had the privilege of leading this young man to Christ. And he was so excited that he literally, he volunteered as one of our uh, young people who walked around the fairgrounds handing out flyers, inviting people in to see the films. He was so excited, he was literally running from person to person, begging them to come and see the films and see that there was a God to whom they would give account. I'm afraid most of us have become very lackadaisical. I'm glad he was that kind of a young man. I had the privilege of leading to Christ. I was there at his birth. And I was there at his death. I buried him. A number of years after that, he had Crohn's disease. And very interestingly, at that time, he was living in Alabama. After having lived in California for many years, how God brings people together for specific things. I was the midwife that helped bring him into this world spiritually. I was the pastor that preached his funeral. Dear people, you do not know when you're going to die. 
I hope you understand that. I hope that you realize that every day you take a breath, you have one less breath to breathe before you will die. Each time you pass up an opportunity to share Christ, you have one less opportunity for heavenly rewards. And God doesn't miss a beat. You will give account for every opportunity you rejected. To me, that's serious business. Because there is a living God, and though he has saved me, yet he has given me responsibility, and he has made me accountable for the way in which I live my life and live for him. God uses people to communicate his word. The angel gave it to John to write, but the angel did not write the book himself. The angel did not start giving testimonies in local churches. He delivered the message to John, but then John had to do the work of giving it to the churches of Asia Minor. The seventh major thing that we see in these opening verses. Verse 2 tells us that John had a threefold responsibility in writing the book of Revelation down. Here's the threefold responsibility. To record what he was told to record. Now, there are some notable exceptions as we get into the book of Revelation. Like, he, he heard some things that he was not allowed to write down, like what the seven thunders uttered their voices. Man, I tell you, every time I get to that passage, I think to myself, I wonder what the seven thunders said. And John says, I was about to write. And this voice came to me and said, don't write what they said. Oh, John's the only one who got to hear what the seven thunders said. But I don't get to. The second thing is to record the verbal testimony of Jesus Christ as given in the book. Now, you know, that's rather important. The Lord Jesus Christ gave verbal testimony back in the Gospels, and the Holy Spirit brought it back to the minds of the apostles. Jesus promised that it would happen. They would bring to your memory all things whatsoever I have said unto you. And so what we have in the Gospels is a, a sanctified and perfected memory. What we have in the book of Revelation is a direct statement of Jesus Christ as to what John must write down. The third thing is to give an account of the things that he saw. You know, that's very important in a court of law. When they call a witness to testify on the stand, they want to know what he saw. And he has to give an accurate account of what he personally saw. If he gives a false account, it may mean that a guilty man walks free or a free man goes to jail. So John has a very high, intense responsibility for writing down things that he saw. And we'll see that as we go through the book of Revelation, different angels take him around to see different things. And so he has to carefully learn what he saw and write it down. Threefold responsibility in writing the book of Revelation. Number eight. Did you catch it in the first opening verses? This series, as we go through the book of Revelation, is designed to give you a blessing. Did you know that if you come every time, even if you never crack your Bible yourself, you will hear me read the book of Revelation? Reading it a little bit of a time, but you'll hear me read it. And it says, Blessed everyone who reads this book or who hears the book read. But you know there's a caveat attached to that. It says you also have to obey the things that are written in this book. You say, what am I going to obey in the book of Revelation? Well, that's one of the exciting things that we're going to discover as we go through. And part of it is living the way that Jesus specifically tells the seven churches who are not living the way that they're supposed to be living in chapters 2 and 3. We find the seven epistles to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We find some specific things that are told to the churches. 
we find some specific things that are told to the pastors, the angels of the church, the messengers, the angeloi of the churches. And those are things that we must obey if we, as a church, a local church, Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey, if we want to receive the blessing of God that is promised in that book. Now there's another thing. I don't have one of them up here with me right now because I was efficient this morning and took them off the pulpit area. But some of you may still have in your Bible from this morning a bulletin. And if you actually read those bulletins each week, on the back you know there's a memory verse. And as you look at the memory verse, oh, don't look yet. What book of the Bible is the memory verse out of this week? Revelation. Revelation. Joanne knows because she types the bulletin each week. <laughs> The book of Revelation. Did you know that over the last couple of years, every memory verse has been from the book of Revelation? How many of you actually knew that, consciously knew that? Every verse, memory verse, over the last two and a half, almost three years now, has been out of the book of Revelation. And did you notice they're chronological? So that if when we started that, you had memorized only one verse per week, at this point, you would almost be completely finished with memorizing the entire book of Revelation. Now, let me ask another question. How many of you ignored all those verses on the back of your bulletin and didn't memorize any of them? May I see your hands if you haven't memorized any of them? Yeah. We haven't memorized them, have we, people? How many of you have memorized every week the verse on the back of the bulletin? Anybody? How many of you have memorized 10 verses or more on the weeks that they came up in the book of Revelation? I saw one hand flop up back there. 10 or more. How about 20 or more? Hmm, no hands. It's a very simple system of memory, isn't it? And it's very easy to go back and review. One verse a week, one right after another. Some of them are quite short. All of them are very interesting. And just think, if you had memorized all those verses over the last couple of years, because I knew I was going to get to the book of Revelation eventually, you would have most of that book memorized and you would immediately, immediately, be able to jump right in and understand certain things that we say and would have already seen certain connections with Old Testament prophecies. I hope I can motivate you to some kind of scripture memory. Believe me, folks, it will change your life. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy words. The word of God, we treat it so lightly, don't we? And yet is from the God of heaven before whom we stand now and before whom someday we will stand and see him face to face. And he'll say, why were you playing that video game instead of memorizing my word? Why were you busy reading that magazine instead of memorizing my word? Why were you watching that TV program instead of memorizing my word? Why were you playing on the computer instead of memorizing my word? Why were you lounging on the beach instead of memorizing my word? Why were you busy stuffing your face full of food and daydreaming about all kinds of carnal things when you should have been memorizing my word? I know I'm going to have to give an account too. I've memorized a lot, but I haven't memorized anywhere near as much as I should. There are blessings for those who read and hear the book, but you must obey the commands in the book. There are special blessings for those who, quote, do those things which are written in this book. And of course, we'll be looking at those specifically when we get to chapters two and three. Did you know you don't have much time according to what the book says here? Because the time is at hand. 
Things that must surely come to pass, the time is at hand. Twice it says it in these opening verses. In other words, it gives us a sense of urgency. That we must be about our master's business as long as we have life on this earth. Because we don't know when it's going to end. Either by death or by the rapture. Urgency and expectancy. The urgency and expectancy when a mother is about to give birth to her baby. Some of you are ladies who have given birth to babies. You know the urgency. You know the expectancy. You know the pain. You know how the labor pains come closer and closer and closer and closer together. Start off with the bracks and hicks and then you start getting those labor pains. And they're more intense. And they're more intense. And you realize a baby's going to be born. And you hope you live through it. And perhaps you scream and your husband's there holding your hand. Folks, I've been, I went through that 13 times. There's an urgency, there's an expectancy. Paul uses those terms over in Romans 8, the whole earth groans in travail, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's going on around us, and most of the time we don't care. Ninth, the initial audience that we have given to us here. We'll have to end with this one. The initial audience. Those are the seven principal churches of Asia Minor. Now, if you look at a map, and you probably have a map in the back of your Bibles, and most of those maps are accurate, or at least generally accurate, you see the uh, Isle of Patmos out in the Mediterranean Sea, and then you look at the seven churches of Asia Minor, and they're spread sort of like an arced fan off to the right, like from your perspective, here is Patmos here, and here is Asia Minor going from Turkey and spreading around across like this down toward Israel. And you have seven different locations about equidistant from one another in that fan, in that arc that goes across. Each church, as we'll see, had a different character. We're going to learn some very interesting things about these churches. Number one, they're literal churches. They really existed. And they had the specific character qualities that Paul, that uh, John speaks about in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. The second thing we're going to notice is that these churches are typical of seven different types of churches that still exist in the world today. And you can classify churches according to those types of churches that are listed. The third thing that we discover and all three of these things are true. The third thing that we discover is that each one of those churches gives to us a picture of different periods of church history up to the present, and we are in the Laodicean church period. The church of Laodicea, which was neither hot nor cold, and God said, I will speak you out of my mouth. I'm sick and tired of your lukewarm, tepid, lousy Christianity. As we look at this church, which church looks most like us? But let me put it this way. Churches are composed of individual people. The church gets its character from the composite joining of individual people into a body. It's a situation where we can't pass the buck to somebody else. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the specific character of the seven churches of Asia Minor. But that's the audience. And we'll be looking at each of those churches in light of their character and what John and thus Jesus, because this was a revelation of Jesus Christ, said about those churches. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. 
It amazes me that when we know about the churches, we don't know about them yet here in chapter 1, but when we learn about them in chapters 2 and chapter 3, that John would use those kinds of words to them. Grace be unto you and peace. Grace and peace. That's God's design for the church. That's God's design for you as an individual. Grace and peace. And it's from the eternal God, the one which is. Currently, he's there, the God who is there. But he's also the God who extends into eternity past and which was. And he's the God who extends into eternity future and which is to come. I'm going to save that next phrase for next week. And the seven spirits which are before his throne. Have you ever wondered who in the world are the seven spirits which are before his throne? Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. And what a magnificent introduction to the one who is the judge of the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ the one who is and was and is to come, the one who is the beginning and the ending, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is there from eternity past and will be there in eternity future, the one who is the creator, the one who is the sacrifice, the one who is the redeemer, and the one who ultimately is the judge who gives rewards to those who have obeyed him and condemns those who have refused him. Thank you again, Father, for your word. Take it and bless our hearts with it, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.